About three months ago, I actually decided to get some corrective laser surgery on my eyes. And so my GP sent me to Dr. Brian Harrisburg, who's very well respected, he's an ophthalmologist. And Dr. Harrisburg looked at my veneers and he said, mm, they're a bit thin. So he suggested PRK as a, as a possibility. But given my set of circumstances, what he also suggested is that he sends my data to 48 ophthalmologists in Germany so that they could look at my particular set of circumstances and decide what course of treatment to take. So in effect, what he was doing, a very well-respected ophthalmologist here, is he was crowdsourcing. He was crowdsourcing ideas. And lo and behold, I don't have to tell you the outcome of the results, because I'm still wearing glasses. But it's a classic case where even if we don't know that social media in health is having an impact on us today, it very much is. I got involved in the internet in 1997. Uh, I think that during the mid to late 90s, uh, we got very, very wrong to do with the internet. What we saw was that the internet was effectively about information, about pushing information out to groups of people. And in fact, some of you in this room may recall that we used to use the term information superhighway, which, quite frankly, we don't actually use anymore. But what I think the internet missed was the ability to create group formation and relationships amongst people. And we've seen that incredibly with social media, with Facebook, with Groupon, and so on. A lot of you in this room may recall, because a lot of you are over 25 years old, but I say to some of my team in my office that if you're under 25, you may not actually recall that there used to be something called a travel agent. And a travel agent was a profession where you wanted to go on holiday, you would call up a travel agent, you'd make a time to go on the weekend, usually an inconvenient time, and you would stand in line, and then the lady or gentleman would sit there, and you'd say, look, I really want to go to Bali, and they say, and they turn around and they pull this brochure out, and they go, well, here is Bali, here are the hotels, this is where you should go and stay. And they were basically the holder of all information, the oracle of all information. Now, given that they hadn't necessarily been there, and given that it was really just their opinion and the opinion of the organization who was trying to sell it to you, there wasn't this layer of information which has now been introduced by organizations such as TripAdvisor, Expedia, and Kayak. And what we're finding now is that various industries such as travel agents, and there are a whole host of them, are actually have been disintermediated. One of the industries, and there are only a handful that haven't been disintermediated, is medicine. And Whilst I say that, I still believe that there is this e-health train that is gathering momentum, even though the establishment may be a bit slower to adopt it. There are tens of millions of patients who have adopted social media for their health, and this e-health train is certainly gathering momentum here in Australia as well. At HealthShare, we look at a patient-centric model of health. And in the middle you have people, us, patients, carers, active health consumers. We have medical practitioners and member organizations and we certainly have some medical practitioners in the room today. We have some health insurers in the room today as well down the back. Universities and hospitals and we've spoken to a few today and yesterday. Pharmaceutical companies and brands and there's some represented in the organization here. And health consumer organizations, I think I spoke to one from um, uh, as the Adventist, um, who are there for their constituents. But right in the middle, we have people, the patients. And I still believe that the patients are the most underutilized resource in health today. And here are two examples. There's Lisa, who uh, diagnosed at 32 years old with endometrial cancer. Um, she found that um, finding people with the same disease as her, when she was very young, was particularly difficult. In the same way, Ben, uh, who has bowel cancer, uh, quite frankly, bowel cancer, there's quite a stigmatism asso stigma associated with it, and Ben found that using social media allowed him to connect with people. A couple of examples of how patients are benefiting from using social media, particularly in, in HealthShare, the organization I work for. What I want to do today is to look at the problems, the reasons or, or, or the problems that social media are addressing um, and the reason why 
these social media problems have been created, then look at the solutions, the available solutions, look at the adoption, i.e. what level of adoption is there in terms of social media, and finally, if we have some time, look at our story at HealthShare. So the overriding problem that we have is access to health information and resources in Australia is certainly fragmented and suboptimal. And here are 10 examples. The first one is, as we all know, internet searches turn up vast amounts of information that are typically static from questionable sources, i.e. who is providing this information, highly fragmented for an overseas audience and not necessarily relevant to you or your situation. And a classic example of this is our friends at Bowel Cancer Australia, who we work very closely with, before HealthShare was working with them, they used to bounce people to an overseas forum in the UK for bowel cancer. And that was kind of frustrating because over there you'd have different treatments, you'd have different um, uh, products, and Australian patients would get quite frustrated. And that's not just a case in isolation. The second example is that learning from people's experiences is typically limited to the knowledge base around your family and friends. And in my case with PRK, when I decided to have treatment, I asked around some family and friends, but what I could do as well is get onto the web and see who else had PRK treatment and, and actually see what their thoughts were. The third example is finding people with similar health experiences to you is time consuming and, and difficult. A group friend of mine diagnosed at 19 with Crohn's disease she spent a lot of time trying to find other young females with Crohn's disease. It wasn't very easy. Um, at the time, there wasn't social media, so it was actually incredibly difficult. She gave up. But with social media now, she could go on there and actually find people similar age, similar demographic, who she could share her journey with. The fourth example is keeping others updated on your care journey can be a burden. If you go into hospital for an acute treatment and call it um, leukemia and you're in hospital for an extended period of time, keeping up people updated on how you're feeling is actually, can actually be a burden. People call, people email, and it can be a burden. And there are a number of technologies, that, which I'll show you in a minute, which have been developed in order to make it easier to keep people updated on how you're tracking in your health journey. The fifth example is that health consumer organizations the Beyond Blues, the Heart Foundations, the, um, the Asthma Foundation, all have various degrees of funding and capability to service their constituents. Some have big budgets, the Cancer Council, some have incredibly small budgets. But all of them are grappling with this notion of how can we get information out to our constituents in a very effective efficient, and efficient way in order to minimise cost. Online discussion boards exist and we all use listservs. Back in 1996, they used to use listservs, but they do rely on old technology, lack quality controls, and certainly operate in isolation. In the same way, hundreds of self-help groups exist offline, but they don't necessarily use the power of online media tools to connect and share information. I was working with a bunch of um, uh, it's prostate cancer groups up in Lismore. Uh, they meet on a Tuesday night, you know, on a, a, a Tuesday night every two weeks. They don't use social media to connect with each other, they call each other and they get together. Imagine the power of using social media to actually get these groups working. Accessing the right practitioners and expertise can be inefficient, time consuming and costly. And this is something that we focus a lot in terms of health share on, um, and, and this will be a, a, a large part of our presentation. But this is an incredibly inefficient part of the health system. How can I find the right practitioner for me given my set of circumstances? Managing a number of health issues concurrently is very difficult. We find at HealthShare that people who come in have typically five or more health challenges at any point in time. So if someone has diabetes, they may have uh, asthma. If someone has asthma, they might have um, a, a child, with, a, an early child that they're looking after. So managing all these concurrent issues is time consuming and difficult. And finally, it goes without saying that understanding the health system in which we live is very difficult. It's a major challenge. Understanding the different rebates, what's available and so on, is for the, in the large part, extremely difficult. So taking these problems on board, and there are a number of them, what I want to do now is actually look at the solutions. Look at the social media applications that are changing health-related inter interactions, leading to improved overall patient care. The first area is in disease management. And 
a great organization in the States, they're in the Valley, set up in 2008, called Cure Together. Now what Cure Together do is, basically they rate treatments. Treatments are amongst people, they rate the treatments, and uh, they can then see, someone says, oh, I'm on Zoloft, another person can say, yeah, I'm on Zoloft, and I rate it seven out of 10, and they write the side effects there. And then basically what you do is you crowdsource the different treatments and work out which ones you think are best for you, given your set of circumstances. Another great example is 23andMe. This is one of my best, uh, I follow this organization quite closely because they, they do something incredibly innovative. What they do is collect DNA from people in the United States and actually going global now. But basically they have a kit, a toolkit here, and you put a sample, you can either put a piece of hair, you put a piece of saliva and you send it into them, and they analyze your DNA and then send you back some results on potentially what you should look at given your DNA. And there are different groups, for example, here that talk about Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi Jews, which are a particular type of Jew, Jewish sect, and they have particular types of genetic issues uh, like Tay-Sachs, which you should be aware of if you're an Ashkenazi Jew. So again, a very innovative organization, and with all the data points that they do have, they're able to find some fantastic relationships between people. The third example is Care Pages. Again, a great organization. I've met them in the States. Um, what they do is they provide for hospitals care pages. So if someone is leaving the hospital, they can, uh, they can create a care page, which effectively allows them to uh, disseminate information to close family and friends about what they're going through in their treatment. It's not a Facebook page. It has high quality, it has high privacy controls in there. They do it on a one-to-one -one basis, but they also now have a white label model where the hospital actually syndicates that out to their patients. Another great example. In terms of maintaining um, health and wellness, Wiggins is a French organization. What they've done is created a scale, which you have at home, you stand on the scale, and it basically tracks your weight on an iPhone app, tracks your weight uh, on, your, on your laptop, but even better, it puts it up into the cloud. So other people can see how your weight is tracking and then you can start saying, hey, uh, John, you can write to John, John, looks like you're not really meeting your goals. It's really about getting together the collective, um, whether in fact it would work in Australia or not, not sure, but it is taking off and becoming incredibly successful. Another example which many of you may well be familiar with is Night Plus, using um, uh, online trackers, to uh, set your goals if you want to do a half marathon or a marathon. In fact, on the weekend, I was saying to Mike the other day, or yesterday, that on the weekend, um, I, did, I did the half marathon. But what I found incredibly confusing and confronting is a lot of people were running, and I could hear in their iPods this voice talking to them along the way. So you basically can program in that you want to do splits of five kilometers, uh, five minutes for a kilometer, and then this voice says, no, hurry up, hurry up, you know, you're behind, you're behind. So you can just hear this going over and over again with different runners. But that is a classic example of how technology is helping you to maintain your health and well-being. Another couple of examples, um, Truth on Call in the United States, a doctor SMS service where doctors answer questions, not necessarily from patients, but more to do with media and government around particular um, uh, things that are in the news, so doctors could give their opinions. Coffee is a fantastic iPhone app. I don't know if it works, and I don't know about the, the um, efficacy of it. What they have is a database of like a million different coughs, and if you cough into it, it can put back to you, yes, you have bronchitis, or you have pneumonia, <laughs> or you have something like that. So again, it's just an example of what is out there. I don't necessarily agree with the efficacy of it. Personal health records, um, I was at a CEBA conference a couple of days ago and we spent so long talking about these electronic health records. Whether in fact it actually takes off the way that we think it will um, is, is yet to be seen. But what we know is in, in the United States, no more clipboard has been very successful. They have 12 million users where people can basically have electronic health records and that is working really well. Taking it out of the hands of the government and putting it into the hands of the people, I personally think is also a very good solution. But people can upload their own data. So data when they go to hospital, they have x-rays. Um, I've met this organization, uh, MedHelp in, in, in 
a valiant, fantastic group of people. Um, and what you do is you basically put in your blood type. How many times people say to you, well, you know, what is your blood type? You go, oh, I don't know, is it A plus A minus? You go into your health record and you can see that immediately. Um, we touched on um, health professional training. Yesterday, SOMO, again, another organization I'm quite close with. SOMO have 110 or 125,000 decisions that basically connect with each other and communicate internal collaboration. A very, very powerful platform. And probably the largest in the world. In terms of public health announcements, the CDC do amazing stuff. We touched on it yesterday, but I'd encourage people to go onto their website, see what they're doing in terms of their social media. They really are at the forefront of what social media can be done in terms of crisis support, disease and control prevention. Um, another good example, certainly not as big as the CDC, is GeoChat from Instead. What they do in the case of a crisis, you can basically log on if there's a flood or if there's an earthquake and immediately you're getting messages from support teams on the ground on what you should be doing. So again, a very, very innovative organisation that is making a difference to people's health. And the last couple of examples, clinical trial recruitment, organisations in the States, the National, the National Council Institute, Columbia Surgery, using Twitter, using SMS to basically recruit people for clinical trials. In the same way, we touched on patients like me in terms of a, a platform, but I think the thing that we missed yesterday was they're using this very successfully to recruit people for clinical trials. And uh, Novartis, for example, just did a clinical trial with MS, uh, which is very successful. These guys did a clinical trial, which was, I think, an <coughs> AML, a uh, which basically blew the industry out the water because they have a million people doing a clinical trial, not just a very small group of, say, a thousand people. <coughs> and finally, probably the area that I find of most interest because it's relative to health share is in terms of treatment, doctor, and hospital selection. So if you look at Arvo in the States, Arvo, they have about 110,000 doctors. You can go on there, you can rate a doctor, you can provide a review, you can say, Dr. Marcus DeGraw, I'll be interested in your feedback at the end uh, in terms of doctor rating. Dr. Marcus DeGraw has got an 18, uh, a rating 10 out of 10. Uh, these are his credentials, this, this is where he works. And I'm prepared to go and see him because he's been rated very well by other consumers. ZocDoc is the darling of the, uh, the internet startups in the US, social media startups. They basically allow you to find a practitioner and then book a practitioner online by seeing the appointments that they have at any point in time. And there are a bunch of them that have started up here in Australia. The challenge that they're going to have, like any challenge with the technology play, is integrated into the back end booking systems. So those are the types of social networking applications that are available. Now the question is, who is using them and what factors are affecting them using them? So um, I'm going to, the best report that we have from PwC is a recent report that came out last month. As with any recent report, it's already out of date because it's a month old, but it is the most up-to-date in the industry. And what PwC did, they did a uh, survey, close to a thousand people, and I just want to get through to you the key uh, messages. That age level has, has the greatest impact on social media activity, but health status also plays a role. So we can see here that the 18 to 24 year olds, they are most likely, if they have excellent health, to trust and share information. If they have the 18 to 24 year olds, poor health, then they're, most, they're the most likely to engage. But this audience here, 55 to 65, is still elusive. Even though they're the fastest growing audience in terms of adoption of social media, they're still the most elusive. The second slide is that consumer reviews top the list of health information reviewed through social media. So consumer reviews, this idea of reviewing a uh, doctor or reviewing a hospital, still tops the list in terms of the most um, frequented uh, frequent viewed information in social media. Friends, family experiences, other patients experiences with the disease, and health related videos, images, posts, uh, posts by posts as well. This will all be in my presentation that will be online, made up on, online later on. Nearly 30% of consumers have supported their health related calls or commented on others' health experiences via social media. Um, individuals are more likely to share positive health-related experiences via social media than negative experiences. 
So up the top here, you can see the positive experiences. Down here, you can see the negative experiences. So the far left, care received at, ho at a hospital medical facility, and for people representing <coughs> hospitals here, this is maybe of interest, 44% were positive, 40% were negative. So in the large part, it is the fact that they, uh, that, that we get more <coughs> positive feedback from social media than negative feedback. 45% of consumers said information found by social media would affect their decision to seek a second opinion. So seeking a second opinion from a doctor, 45% said they would based on what they saw on social media. And consumers value information and services that make their healthcare easier to manage. Uh, excuse me, availability of doctor's appointments, appointment reminders, referrals to specialists, discounts and coupons, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So consumers value information services that make their healthcare easier to manage. And finally, who do you trust online? Well, consumers are more likely to trust information from and share information with healthcare providers. So the doctor and the hospital are more trusted than a health insurer and a drug company. Um, that research is very consistent with the research that's been happening over the last few years. There's no change there. The dilemma that we have right now is taking a drug company or pharmaceutical company and elevating them up into a, uh, at HealthShare, the dilemma is elevating them up into more of a trusted source of information. So what I want to do now is just share with you our story at HealthShare. And I think we have about five more minutes. Okay, great. So, in 2010, we set up HealthShare as an interactive health network, and our goal at HealthShare is to provide people with credible health expertise online. Credible health expertise online, we knew that people were Googling, finding ridiculous information. We wanted to connect them with credible sources of information. And it's this idea of, if we could aggregate the collective IQ of Australia, having the health professionals, having the hospitals, having the universities, having the pharmaceutical brands, all coming together in a collaborative approach, we could do something quite special. So our approach has been, and this is just an example of our homepage, probably from yesterday, where we basically take the consumer through three calls to action. One, search a health topic. Two, find a professional. And three, get answers and support. And on this page, at the front end, we have the latest answers from Australian health experts. So we have a health consumer organisation, Hepatitis New South Wales, that's answering a question uh, in the hepatitis community. We have dietitians, exercise physiologists, clinical psychologists, physios, ear, nose and throat surgeons. Um, we have a whole range of people providing answers to health questions. They can publish answers and they can publish health guides. I mentioned that we have, it's now close to 100 health consumer organisations on board. These organisations came on board very early on with HealthShare because they believed in what we were doing and believed in our, our mantra to improve the quality of health information online. I mentioned that we have uh, close to now 1,500 health experts on board. These are clinicians from cardiothoracic surgeons to cardiologists to ear, nose and throat surgeons through to dietitians, exercise physiologists, and even registered nurses. Our view at HealthShare is that people should get as, m as many responses from various different uh, clinical areas. So in the area of cardiology, if someone has had a stroke, they may well benefit from getting an answer from a cardiologist, but on the other hand, it may well be an exercise physiologist or a physio who may assist them as well by providing a different perspective. Here's an example of the structure in HealthShare. On the left-hand side, we have a chronic disease community, a Crohn's and colitis community. We have a community partner, community sponsor. Um, we have, on the left-hand side, a question and answer module, so the consumer is getting answers, multiple answers from different experts. We have various professors. We have various gastroenterologists in there. We have frequently asked questions. We have related questions. We have <coughs> experiences of people who are going through the Crohn's community. In the same way in the fitness community, a whole bunch of dietitians, exercise physiologists, and so on, all answering consumers' questions. Here is an example of how question and answer looks. If someone comes through, how do I prevent a relapse of anxiety and depression? And we have a clinical um, psychologist, Damien, who's answered the question. Beyond Blue has also chipped in and answered the question as well. And if someone clicks on Damien, up comes his full profile on the left-hand side, so people can see that he's suitably qualified to answer the question. The key thing here to remember 
is that this is not Mickey Mouse 123 who's answering the question. It is a qualified Australian practitioner who HealthShare verifies by going through APRA to check that this person has an appropriate license to answer the question. That is what we want to do. Quality, verifiable, reliable information out to Australians. Finally, I just want to say, having been involved in the internet now for on 17 years, the one thing I have learned, and it still remains the key, is collaboration. The amount of organisations that I see who operate in silos, who create amongst themselves and do not share with other people, I find astounding. This world of social media and what we're doing is about collaboration. We are on a noble cause. Everyone in this room is on a noble cause to actually help patients. What I'd encourage is that people, even after this conference, come together, keep the communication open, keep talking to each other. There's ways in which we can work together. I look forward to being in contact with you today, and thanks very much for your time.